hello and a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters, coming up in the programme. Following the assassination of top Iranian nuclear scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, Iran's defence minister promises to continue his work as the country vows retaliation. As Israel and the UAE settle into a new era of full diplomatic relations, we meet some of those embracing the deal, everyone from expat Israelis to Emirati entrepreneurs. And we'll also be heading to Egypt, where the country's historic Nubian minority is fighting to be allowed to return to their ancestral lands 60 years after their expulsion. This week, Iran buried its top nuclear scientist, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, the man who founded the country's military nuclear program two decades ago. Iran believes Fakhrizadeh was assassinated by Israel using a remotely operated weapon. Tehran now vowing to continue its nuclear work with more speed and more power. Fakhrizadeh was one of a number of nuclear scientists targeted in recent years. Another name added to the list. Mohsen Fakhrizadeh is at least the fifth top Iranian nuclear scientist to be assassinated since 2010. All targeted in similar attacks, either drive-by shootings or bombs attached to cars. January 2010, Masood Ali Muhammadi, a physics professor at the University of Tehran, was killed outside his home by a bomb planted on his motorcycle. Eleven months later, Majid Shariari, a top scientist who managed a major project for Iran's atomic energy organization, met a similar fate. <laughs> Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, Iran's president at the time, said the hand of the Zionist regime and Western government were involved in the attack. Both the US and Israel denied involvement. Shariari was said to be working under Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, who was killed Friday. The latter was already on the UN sanctions list and known as Iran's nuclear guru. Two more assassinations, plus unsuccessful attempts, took place in following years, until a landmark nuclear agreement was reached in 2015. Then in 2018, the year Donald Trump pulled the US out of the deal, Israel seized secret Iranian documents about its nuclear weapons development. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu singled out Fakhrizadeh as the head of that project. A key part of the plan was to form new organizations to continue the work. This is how Dr. Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, head of Project Ahmad, put it. Remember that name, Fakhrizadeh. The murder of Fakhrizadeh could raise regional tension at a time the U.S. prepares for a presidential transition. Earlier this month, the New York Times reported that the outgoing president had sought to strike Iran's main nuclear site at Natanz. Back in September, the United Arab Emirates became the first Arab country since the 1990s to normalise diplomatic ties with Israel. Now, not only do Jews already living in the UAE feel more able to practise their religion freely, but authorities in Abu Dhabi are also hoping the rapprochement with Israel could provide a lifeline to an economy that's been badly hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our team in Dubai sent us this. This video has been widely circulated on social media, a rabbi in Dubai sounding the shofar, this horn, for the Jewish New Year. An unimaginable sight before agreements between the Arab Emirates and Israel were signed on September the 15th. The Jewish community is now emerging from the shadows at the heart of the Muslim world. New prayer facilities have been springing up across Dubai, even if, for security, their addresses remain secret and the site protected. Every morning, around 20 devotees come together with this rabbi, an American Orthodox Jew, who arrived six years ago. Our Jewish community here in the UAE comprises of Jews from all over the world. We have Jews from France, Europe, Australia, America, New Zealand, and our community is really a mix. The ban on Israeli passport holders entering the country has now been lifted. <laughs> For these European Jews already living in Dubai, the new rules allow them to practice their faith without having to hide. 
is that cost? These agreements have changed everything. There are many more people, it's a lot more open, and we're less afraid to show ourselves. Now you can hear in the street people shouting, Shalom, hello, how are you? This reset of diplomatic relations with Israel was led by UAE strongman Mohammed bin Zayed, whose portrait stands at this place of worship. The Crown Prince has also launched an enormous construction site in the capital, a complex including a mosque, church and a synagogue. Religious tolerance is a soft power gambit aimed at seducing the Western world and reviving the economy. Previously, the Emirates had made the Palestinian cause an axis of their foreign policy, but these shifts in diplomacy cannot be openly discussed. In this absolute monarchy, dissidents risk prison. This Emirati has recorded a music video celebrating the agreements titled, I want to go to Tel Aviv. With my friends, it's become a joke. We ask each other, when are you going to Tel Aviv? And we laugh. In the United Arab Emirates, we always side with the decisions of the government. Here, we have made a move in the direction of peace. It's in the interests of the region, in the interests of the Emiratis and other people. And that will make us all stronger. With the arrival of the first Israeli tourists, the sector is adapting. Hotel Armani, at the foot of the world's tallest tower, has opened a kosher restaurant. A representative from the Jewish community comes every day to check that religious standards are being respected. He is the one who has to light the fires in the stoves or make sure that there's no trace of blood in the eggs. Kosher has become a highly sought-after label in Dubai. Two years ago, Eli Creel launched a home delivery service for Jewish customers. The restauranteur has recently received a huge number of requests from luxury hotels and has just hired seven more people. We are about to crumb them because I use them in my cooking, especially for schnitzels. It's very busy now. Of course, there are new players coming into the market. Everyone wants to be here. Any Jewish um, tourist wants to come to Dubai. Yeah. For the New Year holiday season alone, Dubai is expecting 100,000 Israeli visitors. The Emirates hopes that the diplomatic reset will help to revive other sectors too, real estate, health, security. They're anticipating trades of up to $4 billion a year. On the Dubai Diamond Exchange, this Belgian of Jewish faith can now trade directly with Tel Aviv, the other major diamond center of the Middle East. On top of that, he's created a consultancy firm for Israeli investors who may not be familiar with the codes of the Gulf business world. So this is my LinkedIn page. Here you can see the Israeli flag and the Emirati flag. Israelis are very direct. They want fast results and transactions. They don't care too much about who is behind the company. Emiratis like to take their time and sit down with a cup of tea. They like to know who they're dealing with and with who they're actually doing the transactions. His partner is so enthusiastic about this new market that he's learning Hebrew. This businessman from an influential Emirati family doesn't see the Israel peace agreement as betraying the Palestinians. First, this agreement actually stopped the annexation plan, and it's good for the Palestinians because you know, with so many Israeli Arabs, which are the Palestinians, they are here now, they came, they are exploring businesses. It's good for them even. The Palestinian Authority has already rejected the agreements, while the Israelis have made clear that the annexation has only been postponed. Other than the Palestinians, the strong trend towards reconciliation with Israel's former enemies looks set to continue. While the Emirates and Israel have already promised to exchange ambassadors, Bahrain and Sudan have also normalized diplomatic relations with the Jewish state. 
Egypt's Nubian minority were forced from their ancestral lands in the central Nile Valley in the 1960s as General Nasser embarked on a major public works project. The experience left deep scars on a people who, to this day, continue to fight to be allowed to return to land they say is rightfully theirs. Claire Williot and Edouard Dropsy report. Colourful houses on the banks of the Nile, traditional handicrafts. Welcome to West Sohail. A few kilometres away from Aswan, tourists wander through a picture postcard setting. These young honeymooners seem thrilled. We already bought so many souvenirs that I don't have place in my backpack anymore. Yes. Nika and Kamal came to discover Nubia and the Nubians, an ancient people over 5,000 years old. In 1964, they were forced off their lands during the construction of the Aswan High Dam. Like the majority of young Egyptians, Kamal had been taught very little about the Nubian deportations. As far as I know that they are a minority and they are not treated very well by the Egyptian government, this is part of the, of the things that I um, wouldn't agree with. But at the same time, we needed this for the Egyptians. Relocated an hour's drive from the Nile of their birth, the Nubians were moved to cities with no infrastructure and no work. At the time, Taha was around 20 years old. We couldn't say no. Everyone left and we had nothing with us. Nobody cared about us. To keep the memory of his people alive, Ramadan Majoub plays the kisir, a traditional Nubian instrument. He tells tourists of his paradise lost amidst the floodplains of the Nile. We're on our own. We should organize, we as Nubians. It's no good if others divide us. We share our customs and traditions. But the Egyptians have set themselves against us, and that's a problem. The power struggle between the Egyptian state and the Nubians has been going on for years. There have been protests and legal action. Bassam is one of a generation of young Nubians who've tried everything to reclaim their lands. But he stood by, powerless, as the government has done nothing. They promise us, yes, in uh, one day they're going to like help Nubian people to come back in, uh, in old Nubian, but it's not happening yet. Without the government, we cannot come back. For example, we need water there. We need electric there. We are not that people like uh, live in, uh, in high class building, no. Nubian people, they are love the nation, the simple life. To protect his ancient heritage, Bassam has decided to keep up the fight, even if that could ultimately cost him dearly. Dozens of Nubian activists have been imprisoned for demanding to return to their ancestral lands. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Middle East Matters. Thank you very much for watching and see you again next week. You have enjoyed your programme with Air France Protect, promising you a pleasant trip with total peace of mind.